And it is my honor to welcome you today to this beautiful CMA Theater to celebrate. And we have much to celebrate. We are celebrating 21 years of service to victims throughout Tennessee, helping them become survivors. We're celebrating the life of a man whose commitment to justice has enriched lives across the country and beyond. This celebration, like the accomplishments we honor today, could not happen without the help of many people. We would like to take a minute to thank our sponsors, CCA, HCA, the Robert F. Kennedy Center for Justice and Human Rights, and Oz, just to name a few. I also would like to thank the You Have the Power board members who give freely of their time and talent. The amazing powerhouse committee and volunteers who willingly came to the table to make this day a truly memorable one. For You Have the Power, we are celebrating the 21 years we have been able to reach out in advocacy and education to victims and communities throughout our state because of the vision and dedication of our founder. We are proud of those accomplishments, but today we are also celebrating the future. This year, we continue our training of teachers, parents, grandparents, anyone interested in the future of children. Our new and unparalleled victim impact curriculum is now mandated in all Tennessee prisons. Today, we also celebrate the extension of these services. This June, we begin a pilot program with Juvenile Court in Davison County, bringing that curriculum to at-risk youths, hoping to give them a strong tool to help move their lives forward on a more positive note. We celebrate working with the TBI, state law enforcement agencies, and other organizations, producing a documentary to seek ways of halting the horrifying trend and effects of human trafficking in our state. We celebrate and are thankful that we can do this because our mayor and our governor continue to keep safety and education of children and families at the top of their agenda. And now, before I introduce you to one of the two people whose direction and leadership made today's celebration possible, we have one small piece of housekeeping. We ask you that you turn off all of your cellular devices. We uh, promise that our program is not long. You'll be fine. We don't know you won't want to miss a minute of it. And you can do all the tweeting and selfies at the end. OK, everybody turned off. Please help me in welcoming to the stage our founder and former First Lady, Andrea Conte. I have a stool. <laughs> uh, I want to thank Kathy Gurley uh, for putting this program together and her staff. Uh, her, without her leadership and attention to detail, it wouldn't have happened. So let me just lead you in giving her a big hand. <clears throat> I want to uh, welcome uh, Governor Haslam here. Uh, we're so happy that you're, you're with us. Uh, Mayor Carl Dean and Ann Davis. And I want to thank you again, Mayor, for working with You Have the Power to coordinate the dedication of the John Sigenthaler Bridge with You Have the Power's program. And while he's not seated in the audience, I uh, also want to recognize former Governor Phil Bredesen, who you're obviously going to be hearing from later. <laughs> Uh, this year, You Have the Power celebrates its 21st anniversary, advocating for victims of crime and working to prevent crime through education and empowerment. And 21 years sounds like a long time, but it really pales in comparison to John Sigenthaler's lifelong concern for those who are victimized by crime, hopelessness, and inequality. His words and actions have saved lives, and he continues to change the lives of many. Whether talking with a man without hope, on a bridge, waiting, wanting to end his life, or chairing the prestigious Commission on the Future of the Tennessee Judiciary, or speaking to students in the classroom, he connects like no one else I have ever seen. And when he connects, he just lifts everyone to a higher level. 
political affiliation, age, religion, social status, really become irrelevant when he is speaking. He connects, period. It is such a great privilege for you have the power to honor John Sigenthaler today with our Powerhouse Award. And <laughs> Over the past uh, weeks and months, we had the opportunity to um, get to know a lot of the Sigenthaler family because they helped us shape and guide today's program. Uh, I have to, to uh, recognize and compliment John's wife, Dolores. Uh, thank you. You are just the most gracious woman in Nashville, I swear. Thank you. <laughs> John's nieces, Beth Sigenthaler Courtney and Katie Sigenthaler, worked on our program committee. Son and daughter in law, John Michael and Carrie Brock, and grandson Jack are all here today. And I know there are many, many more Sigenthalers in the audience, and I've talked with several of you, so I have a lot of new uh, materials. <laughs> and to a person, the Sigenthaler family is grounded and talented and joyfully creative. It's just wonderful to, to work with them. It's been a unique journey, and I hope you enjoy the program as much as we enjoyed putting it all together. And now I'd like to introduce the honorary chair for today's event. He is a man who loves this city and who knows you have the power well, having served on the founding board in 1993. He's sometimes, he's sometimes known as the mayor of Second Avenue. That's a small but important kingdom in Nashville. So please welcome entrepreneur, Mr. Steve Turner. Well, thank you, Andrea. This is a great day for Nashville. And I'm delighted so many are here for this special occasion. First, I'd like to ask for a show of hands, although it's a little difficult for me to see the hands from up here, but please raise your hand uh, as I call out what your status is. Raise your hand if you have had a bridge named after you. <laughs> Thank you, John. Now raise your hand if you are married to someone who has a bridge named for him. Thank you, Dolores. Now raise your hand if you are related to someone with a bridge named for him. That's quite a crowd. Now raise your hand if you are an admirer of John Siegenthaler. I believe that's everyone in the room, even Dolores. <laughs> Knowing this day was coming, I've been thinking about John and his hands, such skillful hands that have helped shape our city. Think about that. John used his hands to save a man from jumping from what used to be the Shelby Street Bridge. Over many years, John used his hands to write for the newspaper, to write many books, and he has used his hands to work for civil rights and for literacy and for human rights and good government and for the First Amendment. And he has used his hands to make Nashville move forward in many wonderful ways. Let's do one more thing with our own hands. Let's put them together now and let John know how much our city loves him, and let's start this show. From the beginning, it was all about free speech. Dad was born on July 27, 1927, the son of John Lawrence Siegenthaler and Mary Agnes Brew. It was a big Catholic family. John was the oldest of eight, and it would always be free expression at Father Ryan High School and Peabody College. Young John Siegenthaler, the cheerleader, the editor of the school newspaper, 
the student leader, the winner of a statewide speech contest. From school, he headed into the Air Force, reporting for the base newspaper. After three years in the service, he came home and landed a job as a reporter for the Tennessean. It was journalism, reporting and editing for a newspaper that would become my father's great passion, his life's work, his professional career. As a young reporter at the Tennessean, he covered the police beat, city and state government, politics, civil rights. There were hundreds of bylines and many awards. And so, my fellow Americans, ask not what With the inauguration of President John Kennedy, our family left Nashville on a new journey to Washington, D.C. Dad became Robert Kennedy's administrative assistant in the Justice Department. It was an exciting time, but it was a dangerous time as well. My father was chosen by President Kennedy to help assure the safety of the Freedom Riders. John Siegenthaler was sent to Montgomery as a personal representative of President Kennedy and the Attorney General. When the riot broke out at the bus station, he attempted to aid two white girls who were members of the student group. He was attacked by the mob, beaten to the pavement, and left unconscious with a concussion. He's now in our Washington studios with NBC's Martin Agronsky. These Freedom Riders are uh, interstate travelers. Uh, they feel, and they do, have a right to ride the buses. They have a right to be on these carriers. We do not control them. We can't stand at the state line in Alabama and say, keep out. They have a right to come in. And we have a responsibility to protect interstate carriers and the passengers on interstate carriers. Work on the new frontier also meant travel abroad with Robert Kennedy as they met with world leaders. While it was an exciting time, he knew journalism was where he belonged. So we moved back to Nashville when my father became editor of the Tennessean. About the uh, story that we had in Friday's paper, and I'd like to know. At 32, he was the youngest editor of a major daily. Just go into every nook and cranny, Frank. Right? But there's a kid who has a story to tell, find it. If there's an official who has a story to tell, find it. If there's a teacher who thinks that the job's not being done, find her. It was a newsroom where young reporters could develop into journalists and editors with national reputations. Over the years, the paper would win the major prizes of journalism. The Tennessean and its editor would continue to promote free press rights. He was named publisher and later president of the Tennessean. And when Gannett started a new national newspaper, USA Today, Dad became founding editorial director. By any standard, it was a remarkable career. And we thought when Dad turned 65, he would retire. Boy, were we wrong. <laughs> been busy. With the support of the Freedom Forum and its founder, Al Newhart, Dad started the First Amendment Center at Vanderbilt University, which works nationwide to preserve and protect the First Amendment freedoms. In 2002, under the leadership of Freedom Forum Chairman Charles Overby, this building that houses the First Amendment Center and Diversity Institute was named the John Siegenthaler Center. And my father's passion for journalism and the First Amendment continues today. There is a war on the First Amendment. And it's largely because people don't understand it. You know, we don't litigate at the First Amendment Center. We don't lobby. What we try to do is meet with groups like this, small and large. We try to make the point that that First Amendment belongs to all of us. Whenever you can, wherever you can, however you can. Remember how we got it. Remember, the people gave it to us. Do all you can to keep them from taking it away. I am um, John Siegenthaler's son, 
and more importantly, I am Jack Siegenthaler's father. Um, I am so proud to be here today. We are so proud to be here today. Can I just uh, ask them to turn up the lights again, please, because uh, I want to look out in the audience and see your faces. Um, you are all our family and our friends, and, and we can't thank you enough from the bottom of our hearts for you being here today. Thank you so much for all of your presence. We appreciate it. I have some friends and family here to, uh, to help us, but first, I just want to say a couple of things. Uh, Mayor, thank you for this. Um, this is an amazing day for our family, amazing day for my father. And, uh, and we appreciate so much the words uh, that you said at the bridge. Um, Andrea, uh, thanks for the beautiful article that you wrote about dad in the newspaper um, a few days ago. And Steve, thank you for um, your friendship uh, to my family and uh, for all you do for this, this wonderful community. Um, give to the world the best that you have and the best will come back to you. Um, that was, uh, those words came from, uh, I heard them first from my grandmother years and years ago. It was one of her, it was from, it was a line from one of her favorite poems called Mother's Song. Um, I learned it from her and uh, it's, uh, it's some important words that my father has always felt close to. It was an important poem to him growing up. Uh, you saw the, the amazing work of his life on that video. Um, but this day, we've, we've gone to many events honoring you, Dad. Uh, how many, Mom? <laughs> um, a lot of events. This one tops it all. This one is the most special ever. Um, so I just want, I, I just want to say, um, he's been an incredible father and friend but he's also been a, a great, uh, one of the great fathers of this community. And so um, thank you for all the great work you've done for the city of Nashville to make it a better place. All these people, thank you. I'm finding it hard to talk today. I really am, just like you. It's, not, it's, a, it's an emotional day for us. All right. So recounting that my father's accomplishes, accomplishments is not an easy thing to do, as uh, uh, this organization discovered when they tried to put together this event. There were a lot of people who wanted to speak for him. Um, but we made one promise that we'd make it uh, brief, and we will. Um, but we've assembled a, a, a great group of people, of friends, um, of family, who uh, who want to speak today. And, and there was one person who brought it all together. Um, my cousin, dad's niece, Katie Siegenthaler, she wrote uh, a most beautiful poem in honor of this day. And these people who've been so much a part of my father's life uh, uh, are going to, to read that. So, ladies and gentlemen, I give you Katie Siegenthaler. The Bridge, your name, there is no story without a place, a country, a town, in your case, a city, south of the Mason-Dixon, less line than divide in 1927. Unbridgeable. The year you were born in Nashville, a boy learns nothing without love. The gentle father's gift for giving. The Irish mother's faith, always believing in pen versus sword to clear the way ahead. Then give to the world the best you have, she said. You, you know, know such love. There is no action unassigned. Take care of your family when your father dies. Grab a man on a ledge, find a man long hidden, face down the mob, barring freedom's ride. And carry the casket of your fallen friend. You take the assignment. Instinct is empty without intellect. Conclusions weak, facts flimsy, attributions incorrect. Without one who pities the poor reader and will not sleep. Until every column inch of broadsheet reads much better. 
the editor. You, you wield the intellect. intellect. There is no truth absent questions, asked without fear of answers or reprisals, shining like torches in dark places. In politicians' back rooms, mental health hallways, the internet's outskirts, the clan's hidden face, you, you pose the, the question. question. There is no justice without searching. For our locked doorways to its hallowed halls and forcing open the corridors of power to those whom power leaves outside. The captives of Jim Crow, the Jew long dead, the beaten wife condemned to die, you search for justice. The First Amendment falters undefended. The founders are no fathers without sons to build strong ramparts for the assembled. Take the field against freedom's abridgers. Carry words like water to thirsty speakers. You, you arm and, and defend. defend. No man is whole without a home. She who sings your song and clasps your hand. He who owns your heart and reads your mind. She who paints your soul and holds the apple. Who dances in your eyes, never ceasing to surprise. You, you cherish, cherish home. home. And divides cannot be crossed without a bridge, forged of steel and strong arms. Of buses laid end to end, of words on words that leave vast reams of newsprint stained with courage and form an arc entire to span injustice. You are the bridge. Across, across the, the Cumberland, Cumberland, across the country, across the Mason Dixon line. Beyond your time, the bridge, your name, they are the same. Written by Katie Siegenthaler, directed by Denise Hicks, and let me read the names of the wonderful people here. Rip Patton, Beth Siegenthaler-Courtney, Les Kerr, Jack Siegenthaler, Dwight Lewis, Beverly Burnett, Carrie Brock, Hetty Weinberg, Frank Bohm, Charles Overby, Tam Gordon, Beverly Keel, Sonny Rawls, Alice Randall, Margaret Ann Robinson, and Father Ryan students, Colin Carswell, Maddie Sampson, Angelica Flores, William Jack, and Olivia Thomas. Thank you very much. We are in the inner sanctum of country music in Music City, USA, and we thought that um, it would be appropriate to, uh, to have some music, um, some meaningful music to my father. Um, and uh, a quick story, uh, m many of you may know that uh, my, my father and mother met through music. Um, my mother was singing uh, at the band shell in Centennial Park, and uh, my father was covering uh, the story on Father's Day. Um, and I don't think he got a date after that first meeting. Didn't go so well, but they eventually did get together. So music uh, has always been in our house and part of our life because of uh, my mother's uh, beautiful voice on radio and television in the city of Nashville. So this is, uh, we thought it would be t terribly appropriate to, to bring a little music in to this program. So let me introduce uh, the president of the First Amendment Center, the dean of uh, the MTSU College of Communications, Ken Paulson, and the talented Freedom Sings singers. Ken? Thank you, John. It has been my absolute privilege to work alongside John on First Amendment issues for, uh, well, since 1997, John. It's been a great run, and I, I've had the opportunity to have some pretty good jobs, but uh, few rival the opportunity to work daily with you on, on First Amendment issues, and I admire your passion. Uh, and it's never waned. It's only strengthened. I knew when I came to this town how connected John Siegenthaler was. The first time I met John, he introduced me to a governor. Turned out to be an almost daily occurrence. 
Uh, I knew that he had friends in journalism. I knew he had friends in politics. I knew he had friends in government. What I wasn't ready for, though, was the depth of his friendships in music, and that truly impressed me. The man had close ties uh, to the key players in this town, and they counted him as one of their greatest friends. I, uh, I knew, of course, that John had the wisdom to marry one of Nashville's finest singers, and, and John Michael just recapped their, their beginnings together. You may not know that Dolores was uh, the opening act for Elvis Presley in Tupelo, Mississippi. Yep. <laughs> No matter how many awards they give John Signathal or Dolores will always have that. So, so. <laughs> I, uh, but John would talk from time to time about his friendships in music, and I thought, well, he can't possibly be as deep as they are in politics and government. And, and then one night I dropped by his house, and Pete Seeger was on the sofa. And Tom T. Hall was in the kitchen. Short time later, we rushed to catch a plane, and Jesse Coulter was yelling across the, uh, the room to us, uh, wanted to talk to John about her husband, Waylon Jennings, and, and the friendship, of course, John Siegenthaler had with him. One day, John said, you doing anything? Let's go have lunch with Marty Stewart and Connie Smith. And then I will never forget the day he said, Ken, I'd like you to meet June and Johnny Cash. Uh, I was impressed. This is a man... Uh, whose friendships span all genres, all fields, all professions. His integrity it just shines through, and people become friends with John because they so admire who he is. You know, given his affinity for musicians, it is no surprise that John has also been one of the biggest boosters of Freedom Sings, a First Amendment Center touring company that features some of Nashville's finest artists performing songs that, that help shape American history. Today, members of the Freedom Sings cast and a special guest have joined us to perform a medley of songs that really reflect John's lifelong commitment to civil rights, to women's rights, and to human rights. Each of these songs you're about to hear, like the man himself, are affirming and reflect hope that a better, more just day is just ahead. Please welcome our good friends, Bill Lloyd, Jonelle Mosser, Linda Davis, and John Dedrick. People get ready, there's a train coming. You don't need no baggage, you just get on board. All you need is faith. No, you just thank the Lord. There ain't no room for the hopeless sinner who would hurt a mankind just to save his own. Have pity on those whose chances grow slimmer, but there's no from the kingdom's throne So people get ready There's a train a coming You don't need no baggage You just get on board What you need is faith To keep the diesel humming You don't need no ticket You just thank Roads must a man walk down Before you call him a man And how many seas must a white dove sail Before he sleeps in the sand And how many times must a cannonball fly Before it is forever banned the answer, my friend, is blowing in the wind. The answer is blowing in the wind. 
And how many times must a man look up before he can see the sky? And how many ears must one man have before he can hear people cry? And how many deaths will it take till he knows that too many people have died? The answer, my friend, is blowing in the wind. The answer is blowing in the wind. The answer is blowing in the wind. I am woman, hear me roar in numbers too big to ignore. Oh! 
silver girl Sail on by Your time has come It's come to shine Thank you, Linda, Jonelle, Bill, John. Thank you so much. It was beautiful. Ladies and gentlemen, the John Siegenthaler. Thank you very much. Um, thank you all so, so very much. Um, and um, as you can tell, it's uh, it's been an emotional day. I, I, you know, I feel like I've just been canonized by the Pope. <laughs> um, but you know me better than that. You know that would never happen. <laughs> uh, how, does one, how does one begin to uh, say thanks for a day like this, for an honor like this? Um, and I, I, uh, I begin with uh, Mayor Carl Dean. Um, and I, 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 I'll never forget uh, the night uh, we went to dinner, and and he told me what he had in, in mind, uh, naming the, the Shelby Street Bridge for me, and and word got around through the family, uh, as you saw, a lot of family here. <laughs> We're a big family, and. Um, and then Jack called on the phone and said, Grand, I hear they're going to name a bridge for us. <laughs> um, and he did say, as, as, um, as the mayor said um, earlier today, Jack, Jack did say, you know, if, if city council doesn't go along with it, we just change our name to Shelby. But I'm, I'm, uh, I've told Carl uh, how, how deeply I appreciate uh, this honor. I say to Governor Bill Haslam, it's uh, so great to have you come on, on this occasion. Uh, um, saw Phil Bredesen uh, earlier at the bridge and one of those uh, great friends uh, who took part in reciting Katie Siegenthaler Hayes' great poem. Um, it was beautiful, Katie. I loved it. I think everyone here loved it. 
Um, I know um, former Mayor Purcell was here um, earlier. Uh, and I, I just uh, think back uh, my life and my career, and uh, I wondered how lucky I've been. I, and I wonder how I could have been, how I could have been uh, so uh, lucky uh, to have friends like those who've come today. Um, all of you who are out there, all of those who stood there recite that poem. Um, Ken Paulson and Bill and Janelle and Linda and, and John Dedrick for that lovely concert you just, you just gave us. Uh, how could I have been, how could I have been so lucky in life? Um, lucky in life and lucky in love. Um, you know, it. <clears throat> there was a time um, when the worst assignment you could get, if you were a reporter for the Tennessean, was to cover the damn Sunday Park concert. <laughs> We would duck and dodge to keep from going out to Centennial Park on Sunday afternoon and reporting on that concert. And, and when I think of how lucky I was, how lucky I was to get the assignment that Father's Day afternoon, um, and to get the interview that um, beautiful vocalist, uh, Dolores Watson. Um, and I, I uh, think back on, on that day. As John Michael said a moment ago, I, she was not a damn bit pleased with what I wrote. Um, but I was... But I was captured that day, and um, I had to chase her a long time and um, before I caught her. But how lucky, how lucky I was. You know, um, I think of, um, I know I'm being deeply personal here, and I hope you'll endure that for just a, a few moments. Um, there's no way to express uh, to Carl just what today means, not just to me, but to our whole family. And, and Steve Turner, um, for your friendship, uh, for co-chairing this event. Um, it means so much to me. I know you know that, but I want to tell you that. Um, you know, I, I, I think about those words um, that have been part of my life since I was a child, small child. Give to the world the best that you have, and the best will come back to you. I don't know whether hearing my mother recite that poem or hearing her sing it uh, in her beautiful voice, who knows how much of an impact words like that can mean on your life. But I hope, I hope as uh, we, you help me celebrate this day, um, that somewhere we can find and uh, that those words were meaningful and that in many ways I hope or at least in some ways I was able to give to this world and to this city the best I had. Um, 
because the best has certainly come back to me and to mine. Um, how could I have been so lucky? So lucky to have parents who created, and I've talked with my siblings, my brothers and sisters about that, and, and Bobby and Alice and Joan are here, and uh, my sister Avalon, I talked to her yesterday, and uh, she's here in spirit. Um, nieces and nephews, uh, as you know, uh, we're a close family, and, and I was so happy to hear Andrea talk about the way they had, uh, had uh, played a role in making this day possible. Um, I, I said a little earlier, and some of you heard me say that um, after I went to dinner that night and, and um, Carl had said, we're going to name the bridge for you, and um, I went home and Dolores said, they what? And um, I said, yes. And uh, sometime after that, I went home said, Andrea Conti came by to see me today, and um, they're going to give me the powerhouse or what? They're what? <laughs> and so here we are, and um, the two things came together, and, uh, and I'm so honored to have the bridge name for me, and I'm so honored to have the powerhouse award. And let me just say a word. Uh, To Andrea, I remember so well um, a day in your life. You are our city's first lady, as Ann Davis now is our first lady. And I remember that uh, that attack. I remember uh, from the office at the Tennessee in late in the afternoon calling the Bradison House and Phil answered the phone and I said, how is Andrea? He said, she's mad as hell, but other than that, she's all right. You know, sometimes from great tragedy comes great things. And the care and concern now given to victims in our community and elsewhere, because she refused to become a victim, um, means so much. I've thought a lot about this honor, the mayor, and um, and yes, Jack, thanks to the city council, they did go along with it. Um, and I deeply appreciate that. And members of the council are here, and I want them to know that. But, but I, I think at, I think at this moment, about a victim, one who had been rejected by family, without friends. Um, you never knew him, and I knew him only briefly. His name was Gene Bradford Williams, a name that made big news the next day after that day on the bridge. He said, uh, after our encounter, after the police had helped me, help him, help me keep him from doing what he was intending to do, take his life, he sprawled on the sidewalk there, Shelby Street Bridge, feet in the gutter, 
a great crowd had gathered. Police were there, and he looked at me and said, I'll never forgive you. He really did want to take his life, and, um, but he did forgive me. Within a few days, he wrote a letter and actually thanked me. And we corresponded for a dozen years until he died in a nursing home in Chicago, Gene Bradford Williams. And he was a victim, and there are so many victims um, who are hurt, rejected, alienated, punished. And, um, and the thing I admire so much about what Andrea has done and what you have the power has done um, is that it has reached out to people who were rejected, alienated, isolated, punished, and unable to help themselves, unable to defend themselves. And you know, I, I remember um, sometime after the encounter um, that Andrea Conti had, how she reached out to victims. Every day in a courtroom, reached out to let family of victims know someone cared, someone had an interest. Part of that is giving back to the world the best that you have. Um, and that's what she's done. And that's why this Power Harvest Award means so much personally to me. There's no way, uh, there's no way that uh, I can tell you how deeply moved, how personally touched I am by the presence of all of you who've come, how much your friendship has meant. I just thought as I scanned the faces on the bridge and and looked at the people earlier uh, a few minutes ago in this room and looked at those on the stage and with everyone virtually here today somehow sometime i've had the great opportunity to interact with you and um and so many of you have touched my life uh, How blessed I've been. Uh, who knew that Dolores and I would have a son like John? Or that he and Carrie, beautiful Carrie Brock, would have a son and give us a grandson uh, like Jack. I know I'm expressing um, deeply personal feelings right now, but what the hell on a day like this, why not? <laughs> mm -hmm. I, um, I said earlier, uh, old men think slow, and I'm 86, southern boys talk slow, and I'm sure a southern boy. Um, There's one step after another in my life. I've just been so lucky. Um, and wonder at times how it happened. Um, how I was lucky enough uh, to be been born and raised in this city, this great city, um, whose mayors and Two of the former mayors and, and Carl Dean are here tonight, Bill Purcell and, 
and Phil Bredesen and, and Carl, and um, you have given this city such great leadership. And it's had such great civic leadership. Um, I don't know anybody more than Steve Turner who contributes to it to this very day. We're all so lucky to be Nashvillians. Those who were born and raised here, those who came here. This is a great city. Bill Purcell and Phil Bredesen and Carl Dean have made it so, are making it so, but the community leadership that, that blended with the political leadership uh, made us what we are and made the future so bright for all of us. Um, I want to thank each and every person here. Thank you for coming. Each of you has meant something in my life, and I hope our interacting has meant something in yours. And I'll close with my mother's words, my mother's song, Give to the World the Best That You Have. And I am the testament to it. The best will come back to you. Thank you all so very much. Thank you so much. Thank you for coming. Thank you so much.